All right, so Dostoevsky gave us a manual on how to mess up your life in a spectacularly nihilistic way. And he called it Notes from the Underground. It's like the anti-self-help book. A guide to taking the scenic route straight to the bottom of life's barrel. First off, embrace your inner hermit. Cut ties with society, friends, and family. Heck, even your pet goldfish. The underground man, Dostoevsky's protagonist, was the ultimate recluse. Socialize only if absolutely necessary, and even then, do it begrudgingly like you're allergic to human interaction. Next, overthink everything. The underground man was the overlord of overthinking. Analyze your every move, your every thought, until you're tangled in a web of existential despair. Bonus points if you can turn a simple decision like choosing a sandwich into a philosophical dilemma that haunts you for days. Master the art of bitterness. Hold on to grudges like they're precious gems. Convince yourself that the world owes you something and when it doesn't deliver, throw a tantrum worthy of a disgruntled toddler denied candy. The more bitter, the better. Now never accept help. The underground man was the king of stubborn pride. Reject assistance, ignore advice, and wallow in your own self-inflicted misery. It's like being lost in a forest but refusing to use a map because you'd rather prove you can navigate the chaos alone. Cultivate your victim mentality. Blame everyone and everything for your misfortunes. Take zero responsibility for your choices and become an expert at playing the sympathy card. Convince yourself that life is a grand conspiracy against your happiness. Lastly, avoid any form of joy. Happiness is for the weak, right? The underground man despised pleasure and preferred the comfort of his own melancholy. Avoid laughter, sunshine, and anything remotely enjoyable. Embrace the gloom. It's your new best friend. Uh, so there you have it. A uh, crash course in the Dostoevsky and art of ruining your life. Just remember, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you're committed to turning existence into a chaotic abyss, Notes from the underground is your roadmap to the abyss. Cheers to drowning in your own existential sorrows. Nietzsche was not a fan of pity or compassion because it was a hallmark of slave morality. In the Antichrist, he says suffering itself becomes contagious through pity, which is a pretty astute observation. Nietzsche thought that pity at all the levels where it occurs causes us to degenerate. It has a seductive allure because it promises status. If you do something out of pity, you get to look like the Messiah by helping those less fortunate and cement your image as the powerful giver is over against the weak, languishing receiver. There is a certain amount of contempt and pity, which means you get to stand over the person you're feeling pity for. The issue is that this has a degrading effect because if compassion is your cardinal virtue, then you've basically deified weakness. You've made being weak and useless a good thing. The natural conclusion of this is that being strong and successful is now a bad thing. If you are strong and successful, you have committed a mortal sin by being that way. And the only way to redeem yourself is through acts of pity for the sainted riffraff. I do not point to the evil and pain of existence with the finger of reproach, but rather entertain the hope that life may one day be more evil and more full of suffering than it has ever been. To those human beings who are of any concern to me, I wish suffering, desolation, sickness, ill treatment, indignities. I wish that they should not remain unfamiliar with profound self-contempt, the torture of self-mistrust, the wretchedness of the vanquished. I have no pity for them because I wish them the only thing that can prove today whether one is worth anything or not that one endures the social result of this is pretty obvious it spreads weakness all around because a society that implicitly hates strength and success will slowly fill up with weaklings and losers in other words it drags us all down to the lowest common denominator one shrine as a cardinal virtue as the basis of morality it becomes a means by which parasitic people can manipulate those who are stronger and more successful. Creation, scientific advancement, art, culture, and everything else are subordinated to pity. So nothing can be justified except in terms of pity. I remember once reading an article about, is science hitting a wall? This is actually a good example of what happens when we become infected with this mindset. 
basically they were speaking if we should spend billions of tax dollars on a next generation particle accelerator gravitational wave detector or manned mission to mars when millions of people lack decent health care housing and education notice how this works it is implicitly assumed that the only legitimate enterprises are those that help the less fortunate until the world is perfect and there are no people starving or without housing and health care we implicitly should not be spending a single penny on science unless it fulfills our neurotic pity complex. The person who wrote this article, whatever other virtues they may have, were evidently brought up in a society where pity is the cardinal virtue. And now we have to justify science in terms of benefit to the suffering masses. Wait until the world is perfect, and then you can study things that don't benefit the poor. This whole mindset is broken and sick, but we're still caught in it. Look around at what is happening nowadays in society where people identify as whatever they want and expect you to believe them, where fat people are okay to be fat only because they are fat and they are too lazy to lose weight and you can't say anything about it. We live in weird times. Everyone is so sensitive to the truth and just want to hear nice, comforting lies. For some reason, they believe that if you repeat a lie many times, it will change the reality. We know that's stupid. Only because I say that is not your fault to be overweight doesn't mean you are not fat. It's a mad world out there. Guess we should have listened to Nietzsche. While many people believe that happiness is the ultimate goal in life, Nietzsche challenges this notion by asserting that humans do not truly desire happiness. He argues that the relentless pursuit of pleasure and happiness is a dull and meaningless way of living. He criticizes the English philosophy of utilitarianism, which focuses on the maximization of total happiness. He claims that only the Englishman is obsessed with happiness, while the rest of mankind strives for something deeper and more meaningful. Nietzsche introduces the concept of the last man, a pathetic being who lives in a time where happiness has been conveniently invented. The last men are content in their happiness, but lack any sense of purpose or significance. Instead of pursuing happiness, Nietzsche proposes seeking meaning in life. He introduces the concept of the ubermensch, individuals who create their own meaning and are willing to endure great suffering in the pursuit of their goals. Nietzsche cites examples such as Michelangelo and Nikola Tesla who dedicated their lives to their crafts despite the challenging and often lonely circumstances. He suggests that these great minds were not driven by the pursuit of happiness, but rather by a desire for a deeper sense of purpose and fulfillment. Psychologist Viktor Frankl echoes Nietzsche's perspective, emphasizing the importance of finding meaning in life. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankl draws inspiration from his time in a concentration camp where he witnessed how individuals facing unimaginable horrors were able to persevere by finding meaning in their suffering. Nietzsche also addresses the paradox of happiness, highlighting that activities solely focused on pleasure rarely yield a significant payoff. He argues that true joy and fulfillment come from the pursuit of activities that are inherently interesting and meaningful, even if they involve suffering. The happiness that accompanies these endeavors is not the primary motivation, but rather a byproduct of the joy found in the process or the outcome. Bertrand Russell, in his book, uh, History of Western Philosophy, criticizes Nietzsche's ideas, perceiving them as embracing suffering and lacking compassion. Russell compares Nietzsche's perspective to that of the Buddha, suggesting that an impartial observer would align with the compassionate approach instead. Russell connects Nietzsche's philosophy to fascism and characterizes it as a glorification of pain. Ultimately, the question arises as to whether one should prioritize happiness or focus on finding meaning and purpose in life, as Nietzsche suggests. While some may value other things above happiness, Nietzsche argues that individuals are willing to sacrifice everything for a higher value, such as meaning. Others may disagree and believe that happiness is attainable and worth pursuing. Nietzsche's perspective challenges us to reflect on the nature of happiness and the potential need to prioritize other aspects of life to achieve true satisfaction and fulfillment. In Nietzsche's view, friendship within a romantic relationship is essential for its success. It goes beyond mere affection and shared interests. 
It involves actively helping each other become better individuals. This type of friendship breeds honesty and growth as both partners push each other to reach their highest potential. A true friend does not shy away from criticism when necessary. Instead, they offer guidance and constructive feedback to steer their partner away from harmful paths. Nietzsche suggests that a lack of friendship is at the core of the worst marriages. Without this strong foundation, couples may find themselves drifting apart, unable to communicate effectively, or lacking a sense of purpose within the relationship. Without the support and encouragement of a a true friend, the challenges and hardships that come with any long-term commitment become exponentially more difficult to handle. Furthermore, Nietzsche emphasizes the importance of conversation in marriage. He asserts that everything else in a union is transitory, but conversation is the cornerstone that holds it together. Physical intimacy and shared interests may bring temporary satisfaction, but the ability to engage in meaningful dialogue with one's partner is what truly sustains a relationship over time. It is through conversation that couples discuss their values, make important decisions, and establish a shared vision for their future. Without the ability to converse effectively, the relationship becomes shallow and lacks the necessary depth to navigate life's challenges together. Nietzsche has focused on conversation as a decisive factor in choosing a life partner is astutely insightful. It forces individuals to reflect on the compatibility of their values and beliefs with their potential spouse. While physical attraction and shared hobbies may be enticing at first, they pale in comparison to the importance of being able to communicate openly, honestly, and authentically with one another. A lack of compatibility in conversation leads to misunderstandings, constant disagreements, and even the erosion of trust within the relationship. To him, the ability to have deep, engaging conversations that span a lifetime is indicative of a solid foundation for a long-term partnership. It highlights a level of intellectual compatibility and emotional connection that can weather the storms of time. It is through conversation that couples learn from each other, challenge each other's assumptions, and continue to grow together. In essence, successful long-term relationships are built on a bedrock of friendship nurtured through ongoing conversations that foster personal development and mutual understanding. Sooner or later, every philosopher stumbles onto the problem of suffering. We all face pain over the course of our lives because it's nature's way of telling us that something is wrong. At times, This is caused by physical damage to our bodies, which is understandable. If something is hurt, we want to know about it, and the feeling of pain forces us to react. Much of the time, and more frustratingly, however, it's a product of how we interpret the events in our life. This is also important, but this kind of suffering can be unbearable. It can occur in response to a significant event, like losing a job or the death of a relative, or it can persist even without any major external stimuli when struggling against a goal or in moments of doubt, for example. It demands an action, but it doesn't always just go away. Arthur Schopenhauer, one of the big influences on Nietzsche, had a very pessimistic view of human life precisely for this reason. He couldn't find a logical link between meaning and the adverse effects of suffering, and he believed that we were doomed to the human condition. Nietzsche, however, saw things differently. He liked to point out that the only problem with suffering is that we automatically label it as bad. We see it as something to avoid, even though the rational function of pain is to make us stronger. It's actually good for us. Man suffers for a reason. If life has to be meaningful, this meaning can only be derived from suffering. Man, the bravest of animals and the one most accustomed to suffering does not repudiate suffering as such. He desires it. He even seeks it out, provided he has shown a meaning for it, a purpose of suffering. Suffering is the way of life. This is a given supposition. But there are those who suffer but do not find any meaning in their suffering. This is the worst kind of suffering. The meaninglessness of suffering, not suffering itself, was the curse that lay over mankind so far. Nietzsche understood that without the conviction that life has a goal or purpose, Many individuals would fall into despair at the thought they are nothing but meaningless animals in a meaningless universe. As such, if you affirm and welcome pain and interpret it how it should be interpreted, 
then it doesn't need to be that troubling thing that holds you down from experiencing the joys of life. In fact, pain is quite often the fuel that strengthens you to really fight for self-overcoming. You want, if possible, and there's not a more insane, if possible, to abolish suffering. And we, it really seems that we would rather have it higher and worse than ever. The discipline of suffering, of great suffering, do you not know that only this discipline has created all enhancements of man so far? That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Survival is not only the means by which we can find purpose in our lives, but that survival is always a strength. In other words, our ability to withstand the suffering, which is an inevitable part of life, is not simply a question of finding meaning in it. Rather, our ability to withstand suffering is developed by prior suffering. Life is all about learning how to evolve our survival strategies, not to shirk our responsibilities and avoid painful inevitabilities. Exceptions exist, but they're unique. The more you fear pain, more problematic it becomes. The more you observe it for what it really is, the more you can detach yourself from its hold. Why do you seek solitude? Nietzsche once asked, and as I delve into the depths of his profound contemplations, I'm enraptured by his perspective on the mystical realm of solitude. Nietzsche, a philosopher of unparalleled brilliance and poetic grace, embraced this isolation as a vessel of self-discovery and a gateway to uncharted territories of the human psyche. In his quest to unravel the enigmatic nature of existence, he illuminates the transformative power found in the embrace of solitude. Nietzsche proclaimed, My solitude doesn't depend on the presence or absence of people. On the contrary, I hate who steals my solitude without, in exchange, offering me true company. In these words, he encapsulates the essence of solitariness. It is not merely a state of physical seclusion, but an intimate journey to the core of our being, a pilgrimage of the soul. It is through this undisturbed communion with ourselves that we can expand our understanding of the world, for it is in solitude that we are liberated from the distractions that cloud our clarity of thought. When alone, I become an ardent explorer, venturing into the recesses of my mind unencumbered by external influences. The cacophony of daily life fades into background noise, leaving the stage open for introspection and the pondering of life's greatest mysteries. Nietzsche believed that the path to self-discovery unfolds in moments of solitude, as it is here that we encounter the dark recesses of our own thoughts and emotions. Through this confrontation, we gain insight into who we truly are and develop a profound understanding of our innermost desires and aspirations. Yet solitude is not a refuge from the complexities of life. Instead, it is a battleground where we face our most formidable adversaries. Our doubts and fears, it is in these moments of strife that we discover our strength and resilience. Nietzsche understood the significance of this personal struggle, asserting, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. When confronted with difficulties, it is in solitude that we confront our why and forge an unwavering will to persevere. We unearth the wellsprings of our inner fortitude and transform adversity into a stepping stone towards personal growth. Nietzsche's life was one of solitude. His later period in life was spent almost in complete isolation. At the age of 24, he was offered to become a professor of classical philology before completing his doctorate or receiving a teaching certificate. He remains to this day among the youngest of the tenured classics professors on record. He taught at the University of Basel from 1869 to 1878. Nietzsche's poor health worsened, and he was forced to leave his professorship. He had also felt that academic life was a hindrance to his creative thinking. He retired with a modest pension of 3,000 Swiss francs, which represented two-thirds of his annual salary. The pension, though awarded for only six years, was actually paid in full until 1889, the year of his mental breakdown. This money was Nietzsche's main source of income for the remaining years of his productive life, spanning from 1879 to 1888. In his period as an independent philosopher, he plunged into his creative work while plagued with continued ill health. Nietzsche's personal attitude involved a hidden and solitary aspect of his outward persona. Carl John writes, I was held back by a secret fear that I might perhaps be like Nietzsche, at least in regard to the secret which had isolated him from his environment. Perhaps, who knows? 
he had had inner experiences, insights, which he had unfortunately talked about and had found out that no one understood him. In a rare praise, Sigmund Freud noted that Nietzsche had a more penetrating knowledge of himself than any other man who ever lived or was ever likely to live. Nietzsche traveled frequently to find climates more beneficial to his health and lived in different cities as an independent author. He spent his summers in the coolness of Sils Maria, Switzerland, and his winters in the warmness of the Italian cities of Genoa, Rapallo and Turin, and the French city of Nice. He also wrote many letters to his colleagues. However, for the most part, he was alone. Apart from writing, he used to take long walks that could last several hours. Nietzsche considered himself as the solitary wanderer and hermit, the free spirit that had experienced a great liberation from the traditions that had kept him chained. Solitude became the origin of a new category of thinker, a philosopher of the future, a free spirit. We are the born, sworn, jealous friends of solitude, of our profoundest midnight and midday solitude. Such kind of men are we, we free spirits. And perhaps you are something of this yourselves, you who are approaching, you new philosophers. He further elaborates that one has to remain master of one's four virtues. Courage, insight, sympathy, solitude. Because solitude is a virtue for us since it is a sublime inclination and impulse to cleanliness, which shows that contact between people, society inevitably makes things unclean. Somewhere, sometime, every community makes people. Base. Nietzsche indicates that only a few people can bear solitude, but these will be able to harvest its fruits. Solitude has an aspect of a sense of belonging that is not present in the crowd. Being physically isolated, however, does not imply automatically and instantaneously getting rid of the social imprint because society not only makes an appearance outside of oneself, but also within oneself through a common conscience. It is an inner voice that contains the norms and the habits that prevail at the civic level and, to a greater or lesser extent, condition our way of speaking, interpreting, reflecting, acting, and in short, living. That is why Nietzsche urges us to reflect upon this inner voice that conditions our life, and that is only possible in solitude. Flee, my friend, into your solitude. I see you dazed by the noise of the great men and stung by the stings of the little. Forest and rock know well how to be silent with you. Be once more like the tree that you love, the broad branching one. Silent and listening, it hangs over the sea. Where solitude ends, there begins the marketplace. And where the marketplace begins, there begins to the noise of the great actors and the buzzing of poisonous flies. You have lived too long near the small and the pitiable man. Flee their invisible revenge. Against you, they are nothing but revenge. In this alchemical union of solitude and hardship, we embark on a transformative journey where our true selves emerge from the crucible of life's challenges. We discover the boundless depths of our own individuality shedding societal expectations and audaciously embracing our unique existence. Nietzsche believed that it is in this radical self-acceptance that true liberation is achieved. In this journey of self-discovery, you may be frightened, frustrated, and bewildered, but trust me, it's worth it. The price of solitude may be high, but the reward of truly knowing and owning yourself is beyond measure. Choose the good solitude, the free, high-spirited light-hearted solitude that in some sense gives you the right to stay good yourself. All right, so Nietzsche, this German philosopher dude came up with this concept he called the overman or the ubermensch, not to be confused with some kind of cosmic taxi service. Now, he wasn't talking about an actual superhero with a cape. He was diving deep into the human psyche. So the overman or ubermensch, if you want to be fancy about it, is like the upgraded version of humanity the next level in our evolution. Nietzsche was all about breaking free from the conventional ideas and rules that society threw at us. It's like he was saying, hey folks, let's transcend the norm and become the rock stars of our own existence. This overman isn't held back by herd mentality or trying to fit into society's little boxes. It's about embracing your individuality and creating your own values. Nietzsche was all about flipping the bird to conformity and saying, I'm not just a piece in the puzzle. I'm the Picasso painting the whole darn canvas. 
Imagine the overman as the rebellious teenager of humanity questioning authority, challenging norms, and going, you know what? I'm not just a sheep in the flock. I'm the shepherd leading this rebellious parade. It's not about being a power-hungry maniac. It's more like taking responsibility for your own life, being the author of your story instead of a passive character waiting for the plot to unfold. Nietzsche was like, why be a spectator when you can be the director? Now, don't get me wrong, it's not an easy thing to do. The overman has to face the struggles, the uncertainties, and the chaos of life head on. It's like saying, bring it on, universe. I've got my own script and I'm ready for the plot twist. In a nutshell, Nietzsche's Ubermensch is all about kicking conformity in the philosophical butt, embracing your uniqueness, and writing your own life story. Less superhero cape, more rebellious spirit. It's like saying, I'm not just part of the human race, I'm running my own marathon, and the finish line is wherever the heck I decide it is. Imagine a world where we're told to not only accept our fate, but to love it. It may sound strange, but that's the profound concept of Amor Fati, coined by the brilliant Friedrich Nietzsche. He believed that to truly find meaning and embrace life's challenges, we must develop a deep appreciation for everything that happens to us, both the good and the bad. This perspective encourages us to not only accept our existence as inevitable but to love every single aspect of it, even the pain and suffering. Despite facing numerous challenges and hardships, Nietzsche consistently expressed his love for fate and his ability to find meaning in the midst of difficulties. One notable example is his struggle with recurrent health issues, including severe migraines and ultimately mental illness. Despite these afflictions limiting his productivity, and causing immense suffering, Nietzsche embraced them as essential aspects of his existence. He believed that his physical ailments and mental struggles were necessary for his philosophical work, shaping his unique perspectives and allowing him to delve into the depths of human consciousness. Nietzsche's embrace of his fate enabled him to transform his suffering into inspiration and fuel for his philosophical ideas. In doing so, he exemplified the concept of a more fatty, illustrating how one can find meaning and purpose in even the most challenging circumstances. He understood that life is tough, and it's easy to fall into despair when faced with adversity. But he argued that by embracing a more fatty, we can transform these experiences into opportunities for growth and self-improvement. Instead of dwelling on past mistakes or wishing for different outcomes, embracing our fate allows us to redirect our energy towards personal development and inner strength. Now, at first glance, loving pain and suffering may seem completely absurd. Nietzsche knew many wouldn't understand. But he believed that by refusing to accept and love our fate, we limit our potential for growth and happiness. He famously said, My formula for human greatness is a more fatty, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity. By fully accepting the present moment and refusing to wish for something different, we can find contentment and meaning in our experiences. A more fatty is closely tied to Nietzsche's larger philosophy of overcoming and self-improvement. He believed we should constantly push ourselves to surpass our current selves, always striving to exceed our limitations. By embracing our fate, we can learn from our past, take responsibility for our actions, and move forward with a renewed sense of purpose. Challenges become stepping stones on our path to personal growth. Embracing a more fatty requires us to shift our mindset from victimhood to empowerment. Instead of feeling like the world is against us, we recognize that we have control over our responses to events. Nietzsche believed that by loving our fate, we regain control over our lives and see negative experiences as opportunities for growth and self-discovery. This philosophy also challenges our conventional idea of happiness. Nietzsche argued that true happiness isn't found by constantly chasing a state of bliss, but by embracing the entirety of the human experience, imperfections and struggles included. By accepting our fate, we find beauty in the chaos of life, appreciating even its darkest moments. To conclude, a more fatty is a thought-provoking concept that encourages us to love and embrace our fate, including all the ups and downs that come with it. By seeing challenges as opportunities, accepting life's trials, and taking responsibility for our own happiness, 
we can navigate the complexities of existence with a profound sense of purpose and fulfillment. Nietzsche, one of the most groundbreaking philosophers of the 19th century, boldly declared, God is dead. These three words have resonated throughout history, stirring emotions, evoking thought-provoking discussions, and challenging religious and moral foundations. Nietzsche's provocative statement encapsulates a profound shift in thinking about the existence and relevance of God in our modern world. This video will explore the beauty and intrigue behind Nietzsche's proclamation, delving into its historical context, profound implications, and why this declaration remains relevant today. To begin with, Nietzsche's assertion that God is dead must be understood within its historical context. Born into a deeply Christian family, Nietzsche was immersed in religious dogma from a young age. However, as he grew older and underwent immense personal hardships, like studying philosophy during a tumultuous period marked by scientific discoveries, he began to critically examine long-held beliefs. Nietzsche found himself questioning everything he had been taught about religion. Thus, God is dead appeared to be an inevitable conclusion for him, a poignant summary of his transformative journey from certainty to nihilistic uncertainty. The significance of Nietzsche's statement goes far beyond its literal interpretation. It serves as a powerful metaphor for the crumbling faith in traditional values and institutions prevalent during his time. In an era characterized by rapid industrialization, scientific advancements, and the rise of secularism, many individuals felt alienated from the comforting embrace of religion. God's disappearance symbolized humanity's shifting dependence on faith and divine guidance towards an existential void. Nietzsche's bold claim also addresses the definition and perception of God itself. By stating that God is dead rather than stating that God does not exist, Nietzsche highlights humanity's evolving belief system surrounding spirituality. Instead of assuming God never existed at all, an argument commonly espoused by atheists, this proclamation suggests that society has moved beyond such metaphysical ponderings altogether. Alongside its philosophical beauty lies an inherent tragedy. Nietzsche recognized that leaving behind the traditional worldview anchored in God's existence came with consequences. Getting rid of God inadvertently removes any universal source of meaning and values. By humanizing this widely held transcendental force, Nietzsche confronts individuals with the notion that they must forge their own purpose and ethics independent of religious convictions, a prospect both awe-inspiring and terrifying. More than a century after Nietzsche's declaration, the debate surrounding God's death continues to provoke contemplation. In today's interconnected world, religious diversity has drastically multiplied compared to Nietzsche's time, allowing for an even more extensive exploration and challenging of different faiths and beliefs. His statement, rather than being relegated to a bygone era, has endured as a catalyst for discussions that dissect the nature of existence and wrestle with metaphysical inquiries. In the end, Nietzsche's famous words, God is dead, go way beyond just trying to shock us. They ignite discussions and touch hearts in ways that stretch way beyond their short sentence. When we place this bold statement in its historical context, think about what it might symbolize, consider how our ideas about spirituality are changing, and realize that it still matters a lot today, we start to see just how amazing and intriguing it is. People all around the world still wonder, is God really gone? These words keep us thinking and talking, showing their incredible power and beauty. Nietzsche's warning about the domestication of man strikes a chord as I consider the path we've chosen to follow. We have, indeed, lost touch with our primal nature, much like the wolves that transformed into dependent dogs. In our modern world, we have distanced ourselves from the wild, from the untamed aspects of our humanity. The daily grind of office work, with its repetitiveness and lack of variety, has confined us to a realm where we are increasingly separated from our natural instincts and intuitions. The act of locking ourselves in offices, embroiled in repetitive and often mind-numbing jobs, bears a striking resemblance to Nietzsche's notion of the last man. Yeah. 
These jobs not only take a toll on our physical health but also chip away at our psychological well-being. The overwhelming drudgery and absurdity of such work can indeed drive one to the brink of madness. It's no wonder that many seek detachment through various distractions or coping mechanisms. In The Giver, by Lois Lowry, we encounter a world where everything is meticulously controlled by the government, from what people eat to what they see and know. In many ways, this parallels our own existence. We are increasingly subjected to external control and manipulation, from the information we consume to the products we purchase. Our individuality is under constant threat as we conform to societal norms and expectations. Nietzsche warned of the loss of morality in a domesticated society. And I see his point. In our quest for comfort and security, we have neglected the dangerous aspects of life that used to shape our moral compass. Without challenges and adversity, we become complacent and morally disoriented. We are, in a sense, becoming cute but kind of useless, like the domesticated dogs Nietzsche alluded to. In the past, humans lived in close-knit tribes, finding meaning and purpose in the bonds with family and close relatives. In contrast, modern society has fractured these connections. We are so engrossed in our individual lives and digital distractions that we often feel out of touch with both our external and internal worlds. The bonds that used to provide emotional and psychological support have weakened, contributing to a pervasive sense of isolation. The domestication of man, as described by Nietzsche and exemplified in The Giver, is a troubling trajectory. It leads us away from our natural roots, confines us in monotonous routines, and subjects us to external control. This process erodes our moral compass and weakens our social bonds. To counter these effects, we must be mindful of our choices, seek balance in our lives, and rediscover the wild, adventurous aspects of our humanity that have been subdued in the name of comfort and security. How do you make people join radical movements? Perhaps the best answer comes from Dostoevsky's forgotten masterpiece, Demons. Sentenced to death for conspiracy, he knew the lure of radicalism and saw the madness to come. So, this is how brainwashing really works. Attract followers not with logic, but with raw feelings. Sentimentalism, playing upon soft-heartedness, disarms people's rational defenses. You must persuade purely through emotion. Amplify feelings of resentment and injustice. Make them ashamed of having their own opinions. When constructing a radical movement, you must make sympathizers embarrassed of holding a different view. Discourage questions and independent thought. This is the glue that holds everything together. Erase privacy. Create a culture of snooping and denunciation. To keep order in your secret society, Encourage spying and reporting on one another. There should be no such thing as an innocent remark. Shower followers with made-up jobs, titles, ranks, and duties. Actions are upstream of beliefs. If you give a man a made-up title for your ideological cause, he will take responsibility for it. Inevitably, he will start to believe in your ideas. Bind them together in wrongdoing. Unite a group by driving them to commit crime. Once they have done evil, they will never step out of line against the organization, or one another, because they all are bound together in guilt. Eliminate all original ideas. You have succeeded when one no longer has a single original thought in his head. Target the refuse of society. In times of radical change, the dregs float upward and become prominent in public life. Scoundrels. Sullen misanthropes. Sentimental idealists who can be twisted to go against their own interests. Create the appearance of a vast global movement. Give followers a feeling that an irresistible force, history itself, is at their back. Encourage their sense of belonging to a great power, waiting to reveal its strength. Leverage fear of being left behind. Some people dread nothing more than being seen as latecomers to a fashion. Prey on this vanity. Negate the good. An ideology that glorifies disgrace is a flame to draw weak and angry members of society. Make a point of openly dishonoring the noble. Pull down the talented. Shakespeare must be stoned. Foster hatred. 
hatred will bind together the conspirators in the end. Not merely hatred of their object, but finally, hatred of one another and fear of the damage they can cause to one another. Use mockery. Comedy and vulgarity play an essential part in the overthrow of a moral order. Corrosive cynicism and sarcasm accelerate revolutions in beliefs. The vanguard of a regime change is vulgar comedy. Rely on cowardice. As low characters gain influence, let them loudly denounce everything sacred. To avoid seeming out of touch, elites will begin to listen. Some will smile and even nod their heads to approve even the most outrageous ideas. Appeal to the vanity of the elites. In time, a small group of advanced people, who are always anxious to show they are in advance of other people, will assume control of the criminal elements and egg them on. Afterward, many will wonder how they lost their heads. Abolish crime. Make society ashamed to enforce the laws, and the laws are suspended. At a certain point, crime becomes practically a duty. If a radical needs money, and feels he must commit crime to get it, there can be no possible objection to it. Know your allies. Your supporters include many who unwittingly help the cause of radicalism, judges who tremble in fear to give an unpopular sentence, teachers who mock the beliefs of children's families, kids who beat and rob just for the thrill. These are seeds to grow. Embrace stupidity. To change the world, great ideas must either be brilliant or stupid. Nothing else but the greatest genius or the greatest stupidity can cause a revolution. Elevate scoundrels. Disturbances of politics will always be accompanied by intrusions of sinister people into the sanctum of the elite. This humiliation will accelerate a crisis. Silence dissent. Allow some to furiously attack anyone who speaks up. You must curb not only those who dare express an unorthodox thought, but also those who express orthodox ones. Once everyone is intimidated into silence, only the insane will choose to speak. Deceive shamelessly. Brazen lies are easier to believe than modest ones. This will help you identify those who are anxious to be deceived. They are people who, once committed, would rather be lied to than accept the truth that they were fooled. Make use of the ambitious. Understand the dreams of those who wish to achieve influence in society. Entwine the success of your ideology with their plans, and you will become indispensable to their dreams. Damage the prestige of all institutions. Systematically denounce existing authority as a way to foster universal disbelief and desperation for change. Build momentum. You must harness that social energy that drives people to take actions they would never do on their own initiative. It is what makes plotters carry through an insane idea, despite their best attempts to sabotage or delay it. Pretend it's nothing. When the ugliness starts, dismiss it as rambunctiousness, pranks, a form of play which only the unfashionable could mistake for serious. This allows it to countenance and grow until it is far too much to control. Go beyond the turning point. When your allies, who incite radicalism, see chaos erupt, even they may feel appalled. You must make them recognize that it is worse to have planned a conspiracy and failed, than to carry one out. Then, to cover their error, they will ram it through. In the decisive moment, use symbolic means of destruction. To succeed, a radical movement must use a recognized and preferred mechanism of unrest native to the country. In Russia, that meant fires. In America, it may be boycotts, riots, vigilantism. Expect chaos. In a conspiracy, surprises are inevitable. It is common for the most adventurous and reckless to hasten that moment of crisis. You cannot train a group of men to create havoc, and then expect them to follow your every order. The Aftermath Embarrassment When the crisis is passed, the elite will wonder why they complied with the madness of a mob. Few will want to understand what happened. Most will rather leave it behind. For this reason, the real architect of the outrages may remain forever hidden. Carl Jung, a famous Swiss psychologist, believed that nothing in the world is random. He came up with a concept called synchronicity to explain this idea. Synchronicity is a term used to describe meaningful coincidences that occur in our lives. According to Jung, 
These coincidences are not accidents or flukes but rather have a purpose or significance behind them. Imagine you are thinking about an old friend you haven't seen in years, and suddenly you receive a phone call from them the same day. Or you are contemplating moving to a new city and then you bump into someone who used to live there, offering valuable advice. These situations can be seen as synchronicities because they involve coincidences that hold personal meaning for us. Jung believed that these synchronicities were not just random chance but instead revealed something more profound happening in our lives. He suggested that they occur when there is an underlying connection between our inner thoughts and emotions and the external events occurring around us. To Jung, this connection hinted at the existence of a collective unconscious, a shared world of symbolism and archetypes that all humans tap into on a subconscious level. This collective unconscious was like an invisible thread connecting us all, creating these meaningful coincidences to guide us or provide insight into our lives. Think of it this way. If life is like a jigsaw puzzle, where we navigate its complex pieces, synchronicity acts as those perfect fits that show us we're heading in the right direction, or help us see things from a new perspective. While some skeptics may dismiss synchronicity as mere chance or coincidence, Jung encouraged people to pay attention and reflect on these events, because he believed they contain hidden messages or lessons for us to learn. So, what does all this mean for us? Well, it means that life might be more magical than we realize. When we notice these special moments, it's like we're getting a sneak peek behind the curtain of reality. Jung's idea reminds us to pay attention and listen to the whispers of the universe. It's like following a treasure map that leads to hidden gems of meaning. In the end, Carl Jung had a big idea. Nothing is really random. Even the small surprises in life might be messages from the universe, telling us that there's a hidden order to things. So, next time you find a shiny coin or think about an old friend just before they call, remember Jung and his idea of synchronicity. Who knows what secrets the universe might be sharing with you? Many people believe that the most fundamental philosophical problem is this. What is the meaning of existence? That's a question that Albert Kahn has dug into in his novels, plays, and essays. His answer was perhaps a little depressing. He thought that life had no meaning, that nothing exists that could ever be a source of meaning, and hence there is something deeply absurd about the human quest to find meaning. Appropriately, then, his philosophical view is called existentialist, absurdism. What would be the point of living if you thought that life was absurd, that it could never have meaning? This is precisely the question that Camus asked in his famous work, The Myth of Sisyphus. He says there is only one really serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. He was haunted by this question of whether uh, suicide could be the only rational response to the absurdity of life. But why did he think life was inherently without meaning? Don't people find meaning in many different ways? Take religion. It certainly seems to provide comfort to many people, but this could not amount to genuine meaning for Camus because it involves an illusion. Either God exists or he doesn't. If he doesn't, then it's obvious why he could not be the source of life's ultimate meaning. But what if God does exist? Given all the pain and suffering in the world, the only rational conclusion about God is that he's either an imbecile or a psychopath. So God's existence could only make life more absurd, not less. The problem here is that everyone we know and love will die someday, and some of them will suffer tremendously before that happens. How is that anything but absurd? If so, can there be any point in living? Camus doesn't think that everything in life is meaningless, only that life itself is absurd. I know that sounds like saying the same thing, but it is not. The absurdity of life arises, according to Camus, from the relationship between man and the world. Man seeks through reason to understand the world and the world provides no clear responses. In other words, the absurdity of life is lucid reason confronting its limits. It is the human mind seeking to understand a world that it will never succeed in understanding. Add to this the fundamental fact that we all die in the end and that nothing we can do during our lives will transcend us and you have absurdity. Sisyphus, he's the unlucky protagonist of the ancient Greek myth where having royally upset the gods, he's condemned for all eternity to push a boulder up a mountain 
only for it to roll all the way back down upon reaching the top. Each time, Sisyphus must descend and start again. He must do this over and over, forever. Doesn't sound great, does it? Poor guy. Thank God our lives aren't like that. Or are they? Indeed, 20th century French thinker Albert Camus believed the myth of Sisyphus to be a brilliant metaphor for our everyday existence. Sisyphus embodies the human condition. We toil away performing repetitive, meaningless tasks each day until we die, and we can never achieve anything that can transcend that. The difference is that Camus imagines Sisyphus being happy in the only way that humans will ever be able to be happy. Sisyphus is fully conscious of the absurdity of his condition. He is conscious of it, and he is able to choose to rebel against it. He can choose. Each time he recuperates the rock at the bottom of the mountain to devote himself fully and consciously to the meaningless task as a way of flipping off the gods who sought to punish him by forcing him to it. Trudging down the mountainside, he recognizes the full extent of his wretched condition, yet all Sisyphus' silent joy is contained therein. His fate belongs to him. His rock is his thing. Kama suggests that this is how we should all live. Fully and constantly conscious of the absurdity of life, but fully engaged in life anyway, as a kind of revolt against our condition. Pleasure and toil are fully compatible with this way of life and not meaningless. Unless the pleasure and toil are used as a way of escaping the confrontation of and consciousness of the absurdity of life. It is not nihilism, quite the opposite. Life is very meaningful and should be lived, according to Camus, as intensely as possible because it is all that we have. When we die, there is nothingness and nothing we can do in our lives will allow us any measure of immortality. Just as Sisyphus chooses to march down after his rock, Thereby accepting the futility of his punishment and reshaping his tragic fate, Camus argues we become fully alive through choosing to acknowledge the hopelessness of the human condition and carry on regardless. By approaching life with full consciousness, with vitality and intensity, by becoming the masters of our absurd fate, this is how we answer the question of suicide, how we defy futility and establish what it means to live. Ultimately, then, while Thomas believes we are condemned to absurdity by the human condition. His point is that that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's only by confronting this absurdity and heroically carrying on in spite of it that a truly authentic life can be lived. Indeed, as Thomas concludes the myth of Sisyphus, the struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. The 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer is often regarded as a pioneer of pessimistic philosophy and a significant figure in the realm of metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics. Schopenhauer's philosophy delves into the nature of existence, human suffering, and the concept of the will. Through his unique perspective and critical analysis, Schopenhauer's philosophy continues to provoke thought and debate to this day. Born in 1788 in Danzig, Poland, Schopenhauer grew up in a highly intellectual environment with his father being a successful merchant and his mother having literary interests. After studying at various universities, including Göttingen and Berlin, Schopenhauer developed his philosophical ideas influenced by the works of Immanuel Kant and other prominent thinkers of his time. Schopenhauer highly valued the irrational and the beautiful of this world. Is it known for one of the most striking opening sentences in philosophical writing? The world is my representation. He is saying that we can't know reality. We only know the reality that our senses interpret for us in order that we survive and procreate. We aren't created to know truth or love. Those ideas are human delusions. Arthur Schopenhauer talked about two different ways that the world tends to appear to human beings as will and as representation or idea. When the world appears as will, it is being brought before consciousness by the faculty of the will. When it is brought before consciousness as idea, it is being made to appear before rational thought. Schopenhauer was basically saying that Parmenides and Heraclitus were each right in their own way. This way, Schopenhauer could describe at the same time his own ideas concerning the world and the will and show why centuries of philosophers from Plato to Kant 
describe the world in the way that they did. He did not need to argue against the entire history of philosophical thought. Just to say that in focusing so intently on rationality and the world as ideation or representation, that philosophers had missed a whole big something. The world is willing. Um, so when the world appears as idea, it appears to be objective, predetermined, eternal, and unchanging rationality sets itself upon the world in this way and transforms everything into something like numbers. The number five always means five, whether we refer to five apples, five horses, or just plain old five as a contentless conceptual container. For rationality, the things in this world are merely imperfect instantiations of perfect concepts without instantiation. Just as when discussing Plato in a classroom, a professor will point to a chair and say, that this chair is merely an imperfect instance of chairness itself. And, of course, this is not how the world appears as will. The world as will appears to be changeable and constantly changing. The will asks not what is its essence, but to what use can I put it? What can it be for me? Schopenhauer saw the will as a restless faculty, never to be satisfied. And so he thought that one needs to stop willing and to see the world through the lens of representation in order to avoid suffering and to be happy. He shunned the academic community during his time and wrote independently about will, which he believed is an outside force acting negatively on people. He was heavily influential on his contemporaries, including Nietzsche, and has caused a ripple effect through various branches of philosophy throughout the 20th century. Schopenhauer believed in transcendental identity, having reached some of the same conclusions as Eastern philosophers. Like Buddhist philosophy, Schopenhauer believed that attachments to things and desires causes suffering, and that a person must learn to detach in order to end the suffering. If a person can't detach from the thing he or she desires, Schopenhauer theorized that the person would become one with the desire and would be unable to identify himself or herself outside of the desire for that object. Schopenhauer's pessimistic outlook on life emerges from his metaphysical concepts. He believed that the world is characterized by suffering and dissatisfaction, which are inherent consequences of the will's ceaseless striving. According to him, desires are insatiable and fulfillment is temporary, leading to a perpetual cycle of longing and disappointment. This pessimism is rooted in his view that pleasure is merely the temporary absence of suffering and not a genuine state of contentment. In his seminal work, The World as Will and Representation, Schopenhauer famously declared that life is a business that does not cover the costs. He contended that human existence is fraught with pain from basic needs and physical ailments to emotional distress and existential angst. This perspective led him to assert that the most desirable state is one of negation, where the will is transcended and suffering is overcome. Some of his theories about psychological attachment were reinterpreted and expanded upon by Sigmund Freud, and it was Schopenhauer who first claimed that the human action of sex had gone far too long without academic analysis. Because Schopenhauer believed that human action is not motivated by logical, reasonable forces. He promoted that criminal punishment is necessary to prevent future crimes. In particular, capital punishment should stop people from being harmful instruments of nature again. People cannot be rehabilitated and are not capable of change, according to Schopenhauer. And so it is the responsibility of individuals to exercise free will by taking responsibility for their personality and actions. In Arthur Schopenhauer's perspective, the notion of free will is called into question. He argues that while individuals can carry out actions based on their desires, they do not possess the ability to choose or determine those desires. This concept is encapsulated in the famous quote paraphrased by Albert Einstein, a man can do as he will, but not will as he will. Essentially, Schopenhauer suggests that our wants and desires are predetermined by our nature or inherent programming, negating the idea of genuine freedom. One can observe this lack of free will in our everyday experiences. Take the example of hunger. When an individual feels hungry and decides to eat something, they may believe they are freely choosing to satisfy their hunger. However, According to Schopenhauer, this decision is not truly voluntary. 
Rather, their conditioned or innate nature compels them to eat in response to hunger. Our wants and desires, whether they be anger, thirst, jealousy, fear, or disgust, all follow the same pattern. Even in cases where individuals attempt to resist their immediate impulses, Schopenhauer argues that their character dictates such choices. Refusing to eat when hungry, for instance, may be attributed by some to personal discipline or health consciousness. Yet Schopenhauer would contend that these motives are not independent choices, but rather secondary impulses overpowering primary ones. Thus, even when we seem to defy our initial inclinations, we are still subject to a predetermined disposition. Schopenhauer's stance ultimately rejects the notion of free will as it is commonly understood. However, it is important to note that his perspective does not align with hard determinism which holds that every action is inexorably determined by pre-existing causes. Instead, Schopenhauer allows for external circumstances to influence behavior while maintaining that our unchangeable character remains constant. It is theoretically plausible for someone to desire a complete transformation of their character and behavior. They may decide to become an entirely different person starting tomorrow. However, even in this hypothetical scenario, Individuals rarely achieve such radical changes. Personal growth and attitudinal shifts typically require lengthy psychological therapy, implying that humans possess an underlying stability that can only be transformed with immense effort. This notion parallels the idea of imprinting, where certain traits and inclinations are deeply embedded within us, guiding our will. The debate surrounding free will and determinism is far from being definitively settled. Philosophers are divided on the matter with some embracing determinism or quasi-deterministic interpretations, while others propose indeterminism. Indeterminism suggests that not all events are uniquely determined by preconditions, allowing room for chance or coincidence. This perspective aligns with ideas explored in astrophysical chaos theory where unpredictable outcomes are possible. In a lighthearted note, one can even apply this argument to a casual encounter with a hairdresser. Engaging in a conversation about Schopenhauer's philosophy of free will may perplex the hairdresser and eliminate small talk as their understanding of human agency is challenged. Ultimately, one will still receive the desired hairstyle or perhaps even accept a different one without complaint as hair grows back on alternatives like wearing a cap exist. This anecdote serves as a reminder that even in situations where choices seem free, underlying conditioning and circumstances may limit our true autonomy. In conclusion, Schopenhauer's viewpoint challenges our commonly held beliefs regarding free will. While we may feel that we have the freedom to act according to our desires, Schopenhauer posits that our wants and inclinations are ultimately determined by our nature or inherent programming. Although the debate between free will and determinism continues, it is evident that our choices are influenced by factors beyond our conscious control. In a letter to his friend Lucilius, the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca reflects on the following statement from the ancient Greek philosopher Epicuture. If you live according to nature, you will never be poor. If you live to please the opinions of others, you will never be rich. Commenting on this observation, Seneca adds, For nature has very few demands, whereas the tyranny of opinion is immense. To illustrate this point, Seneca asks Lucilius to imagine what would occur if he inherited vast wealth. Suppose you inherit the estates of many rich men. Fortune carries you well beyond the normal limits of a private income and covers you with gold, clothes you in the finest purple, and brings you to such an apex of luxury and wealth that you can pave your land with marble till you not merely possess riches, but actually walk on them. On top of this, you have statues, paintings, and the ultimate adornments of luxury that any of the arts can devise. What might the result of all this wealth be? Would Lucilius find long-term happiness at last? Probably not. Seneca writes, in fact, the only thing you will learn from all this will be to want still more. Indeed, the problem with things like wealth and fame is that they have no limit. There is always more popularity to secure, always more money to accumulate. What seemed enough yesterday has simply reset today's baseline. We must have more. As Seneca writes, 
the desires implanted by nature, for example, for food, water, human connection, have a limit, but those born from false opinion have no way of reaching an end. If we measure ourselves according to external status symbols, we will never be satisfied. For where does it end? The upshot, then, is that if we are to possibly feel at peace in life, we cannot allow ourselves to be enslaved by desires that are impossible to fulfill. Pull yourself back from empty pursuits, Seneca commands. And if you want to know whether your ambitions stem from a natural desire or from some blind and trivial impulse, just ask whether they have a definite terminus. If no matter how far you travel, there always seems to be some further place you need to reach. That is a sure sign that the desire is contrary to nature. We must ask ourselves, what destination are we really trying to reach? Who knows? Maybe we might be there already. Of course, we need money and resources to survive. Seneca is not denying this. His point is simply not to confuse survive with thrive. If we have enough resources so that our natural desires and those of our dependents are reliably met, then why bother seeking more? What's it all actually for? If we dedicate our only lives to the accumulation of status and resources, we climb aboard a golden treadmill frantically moving but not actually going anywhere. The life of such people is always unfinished, Seneca says, and we cannot stand prepared for death if we're just beginning to live. We must instead make sure that we have already lived enough and no one could think this about himself if he is forever involved in starting to live. You should not suppose that such people are few in number. Almost everyone is like this. Indeed, they begin to live only when it is time to stop. If you think this strange, I will add something which will surprise you even more. Some people leave off living before they've even begun. If the purpose of philosophy is to prepare us for death, as many of the ancients thought, then we can view Seneca's words as a challenge. Will we vainly, blindly strut upon the gilded treadmill of wealth and fame and resource accumulation ever grasping forward, but with no real destination in mind? Or will we climb off? And with eyes wide open, appreciate the richness, the beauty, the joy of life that is right here before us, ready for us to claim it. Ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus advocated an atomic, naturalistic view of the universe. He rejected the existence of an immaterial soul or of anything non-physical and said that the gods have no influence on our lives. As such, he believed being dead is not to be feared, for none of us will ever experience it. Death does not concern us because as long as we exist, death is not here, and once it does come, we no longer exist. From this doctrine arose the epitaph, I was not, I was. I am not. I do not care, which is inscribed on the gravestones of Epicurus's followers and seen on many ancient gravestones of the Roman Empire. No consciousness means no time. To fully grasp Epicurus's point, consider what happens when we're unconscious. We do not experience unconsciousness. In dreamless sleep, for instance, we wake in the morning and in our most recent memory is the last thing we did at night. Though hours may have passed, we did not experience their passing. We just jumped to the next conscious episode. So though on the naturalistic view, death is often characterized as an eternal abyss, a black silence, a terrifying nothingness, this characterization is misleading, for it suggests we'll experience this eternal blackness. But death means the experiencing subject no longer exists. There will be no consciousness there to experience silence, darkness, or the passing of time. The reason we struggle to imagine what this state is like is because there is nothing it is like to be in it. Consciousness is all we've ever known and all we ever can know. We learn objectively that the universe existed before we were born and that it will continue after our deaths. But from our subjective perspectives, all that's ever existed is our consciousness. The non-existence of consciousness thus feels like an outrageous impossibility. We struggle to comprehend our lives as a finite block of time because we live only inside the block. We characterize anything outside the block as eternal blackness or oblivion because that's a tempting conception of nothingness. But by contemplating unconsciousness and dreamless sleep, we can recognize that nothingness isn't like that. As the Roman philosopher Lucretius also advises in his beautiful reflection on mortality, 
Just like before we were born in death, we won't experience anything that happens. No pleasure, no pain, no anxiety, no fear, because the conscious self simply isn't there. If after death, our consciousness was to be magically resurrected millions of years in the future, we'd have no sense of the time that had passed. Our last conscious experience would have seemed but a moment ago. So Epicurus advises, don't worry about being dead. It won't even last a millisecond. Only one thing is important. The great Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius declared 2,000 years ago in his meditations, a collection of his journal entries, to behave throughout your life towards the liars and crooks around you with kindness, honesty, and justice. We must not let the poor judgment of others impact the purity, lucidity, moderation, and justice of our minds, Marcus advises. But should aspire instead to be like an ever-flowing self-cleansing spring. Suppose someone standing by a clear, sweet spring were to curse it, it just keeps right on bringing drinkable water bubbling up to the surface. Even if he throws mud or dung in it, Before long, the spring disperses the dirt and washes it out, leaving no stain. Um, So how are you to have the equivalent of an ever-flowing spring? If you preserve your self-reliance at every hour in your kindness, simplicity, and morality. If someone treats you unjustly, do not let that injustice muddy the waters of your mind. Marcus implores, rather wash it out with kindness. This doesn't mean rolling over if people mistreat you. Rather, it simply means not stooping to their level, not seeking revenge, not being blinded by what they have done, but remaining just and true in your thoughts and actions. For kindness is not weakness. In fact, it reveals strength of character. Marcus claims that choosing kindness is wholly within your power, and there's no better time to start doing so than now. Try living the life of a good person and see how it too suits you. A person who's gratified by the lot he's been assigned by the universe and satisfied with the justice of his acts and the kindness of his character. Living a good life may not be easy, but it is simple. Marcus thus suggests, keep a steady stream of kindness at the forefront of your thoughts and actions and the good life will be yours. He concludes, If you carry out every present task by following right reason assiduously, resolutely, and with kindness, if, rather than getting distracted by irrelevancies, you keep your guardian spirit unspoiled and steady, if you engage with the task not with expectations or evasions, but satisfied if your current performance is in accord with nature, and if what you say and express is spoken with true Roman honesty, you'll be living the good life. And there's no one who can stop you doing so. Small actions not only add up, they often repeat themselves. Let no one think lightly of evil and say to himself, sorrow will not come to me. Little by little, a person becomes evil as a pot is filled by drops of water. Let no one think lightly of good and say to himself, joy will not come to me. Little by little, a person becomes good as a pot is filled by drops of water. When it comes to the good life, We must remember the power of small acts for ourselves and others. Marcus Aurelius called the fruit of this life, good character and acts for the common good. However, the secret to the good life is that it's not really a secret at all. To quote the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, day by day, what you do is who you become. 